So um, just a bridge sort of like what happened before as this one is basically just like a continuing session to what happened in Osaka where we thought that we will almost die after Typhoon. Um, so basically that was like proof of work to proof of stake sort of like transition session uh, where we hosted like a, some community sessions as well uh, alongside the ETH1 in ETH 1X to ETH 2 and ETH 2 sessions. Um, it was kind of successful in a huge room where Vitalik went on like a huge session and brought like so many ETH research posts of like that inspired the discussions that happened uh, during the session. Um, and then um, just to give you a quick overview of the um, the roadmap of what we've been discussing, uh, like. Just a few points. Uh, mainly, we've been discussing the IP1559, the fee market change for Ethereum, uh, which was a very hot discussion, and also the Procpow, which we agreed all uh, that's sort of a conspiracy driven IP, and we should not keep much of a, like, we should not, like, pay much of a attention to that, as that's very conspiracy driven. Um, then we also started discussing about state rent um, as. Uh, we realized that many people are using blockchain as a storage. Um, so we were discussing uh, that there should be uh, rent free, uh, that there should be some rent fee for the uh, providers. Um, it also kick off the ideas for stateless client uh, with Alex and Piper. I'm not sure if they are there, but um, they started um, pretty much discussing how we make Ethereum stateless. And then they follow up the session in Paris after ECC in 2020, which was the COVID session as well. Uh, and then we uh, were discussing also sharding, uh, like how Ethereum can like, um, how like shards, um, like the shard design basically. Uh, and then the Ethereum uh, transaction history archive, uh, which is basically about uh, how we can keep the full state of uh, all transactions and like archive notes and all that. Um, so um, you guys may be wondering why everybody's sitting down. Even I'm like sitting down because I don't want to be like too much like, oh, I'm like important and you guys are not. Uh, but basically, three magician sessions are always like everybody sort of like on the same, um, same like line or something that like there is no such thing as like oh these are the core devs or like oh these are the speakers and they're important like no like everybody is equal and everybody is um as important as whether you're a speaker or you are sitting in the audience uh and i highly encourage you to join us anytime in this like how circle um so if you have like something to say to this session or like to the topic that is being discussed feel free to anytime uh switch like anybody just like take their seat and be like hey like i want to like say something to this uh and even grab a mic um and i also encourage you to take some notes or some like ideas that you have we also have a marcus which is like Thank you so much. Who is going to take a notes from this session? And then also, I forgot your name. Uh, but uh, there is a guy who is going to take a note in Spanish. So we are going to have a translated notes uh, from this session as well. Uh, and make sure to publish them on Ethereum Magicians Forum. Um, and then I just figured out that this would be a cool quote um, to like kick off this session to like make Ethereum more diversified. Um, as I feel like we need more clients um, to be run in the Ethereum ecosystem, and we should not be um, just focusing ourselves or on the main two clients. And by the way, the QR code we are going to let the QR code be there, and that's where you can find the slides. And uh, in the slides are many links that what I've been just mentioning during my introduction speech. And that's pretty much it from my side. I'm just going to try to encourage you all to like speak up uh, and like don't be scared. Even the mic, it doesn't bite you. And it's just like our friend. And um, if you will try to, like, if you want to like speak up about something, uh, we want you to like make sure that um, everybody will hear you basically. And that's pretty much it. Um, I'm excited for this. Um, just giving the word to Tim and let's kick off. Sweet. Um, 
Yeah, thanks, Annette, for the intro. Um, yeah, so I guess on the point of people asking questions and contributing, I do not have near three hours of like contents here, right? Like, so like, <laughs> you know, I, I have a couple questions to kick things off, but like, this is very much on you. If uh, you will have stuff you want to discuss, this is the place for it, um, or we'll be out of here in 50 minutes. Um, but I guess, yeah, there's like three things on the slides I think uh, are, are neat to discuss with the, the people here. Um, first is just like how the merge went. It was a pretty big piece of work, um, not only technically, but just like making it happen from like a human perspective. We have all these teams working together. So um, yeah, I'm personally curious to hear just from the different client teams and folks involved, like how that whole process went. Is there things we can do better for like the next one um, or things we did well that we didn't expect to do so well? Um, after that, like we keep talking about like the surge, verge, purge, splurge, all that stuff. Um, I think I just want to make sure we have space, you know, to hear from different client teams about like how they see priorities there, what they think is important, where things are generally at, and then answer all the questions from you guys because I think it's uh, easy to like look at the four acronyms or, or like meme names, and then uh, when you get into the details, there's like many more open questions. So hopefully we can get into some of those. Um, and then, yeah, we'll try and keep time at the end, um, or actually we will keep time no matter what at the end, um, to, to just discuss like specific EIPs, like there's a bunch of EIP champions. Shanghai planning has been a bit different because we, we canceled the calls after the merge to give people a break. Uh, so everyone has like EIPs that they want to put in. Um, not a lot of places to discuss them right now, so we'll use this as a sort of pressure valve for some of those discussions. Um, yeah, so that's, that's roughly it. But again, yeah, please ask questions throughout. Um, Otherwise, this is going to be over pretty quick. Um, but yeah, I, to, to kick it off, um, I, I just was curious to hear from like different folks on Kite teams, like their perspective on like not like technically how the merge went. Like I think we've we've covered that a lot already, but just how they felt during the process and like you know now that it's over and and we have a bit more distance. Like looking back, how do you feel it, it went and are there things that could have been better? So yeah. I made the mistake of sitting beside Tim. Um, uh, it was stressful. It was really, really stressful and really drawn out for a long time. And I think as core devs, we, we've all felt that real pressure. Um, so that's, that's kind of the personal view of it. Uh, I don't know how you change that. I'm not sure we should, because we should have been under pressure to, sh to ship, and we were. Um, but you know, I, I guess I'd say never be in doubt that core devs feel the pressure to ship. Um, we really do. Uh, yeah, I think there were a lot of really good things we did. The testing that we, we managed to do was phenomenal. Um, and it was a, kind of another couple of steps up on anything we've done before for hard forks. And that kind of coordination and, and work that went into that was absolutely fantastic. Um, starting with the client teams testing their releases, but then the EF support of spinning up the shadow test nets were a brilliant idea. Um, and uh, Mario and, and other people contributing to the um, test suites uh, and hive tests and that kind of thing, really, really valuable. I don't think we started those hive tests in particular early enough, um, and I think that probably is a knock-on effect from we didn't necessarily include the execution clients early enough, uh, which might have been because they were busy with you know 1559 or something giant. Um, so I'm not sure what the timelines there exactly were, but it, it felt like consensus side almost felt confident and ready, and execution was kind of like. Oh yeah, the merge. The merge is the next thing. We've we've got time now. We can look, and it wasn't wasn't a surprise to them. Don't don't get me wrong, but I think that was a big deal that that would have helped to bring that forward and then have more time on things like being able to pay real attention to the hive test. We were struggling as client developers to keep up with the support and the last minute things we knew about, and dealing with these hive test reports that are in a, a format that particularly for the consensus side we weren't particularly familiar with. Thank you. <laughs> Made the mistake of sitting too close to age. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I, I agree. It was really stressful. Very, very stressful four years. Um, I think a large part of it was uh, figuring out how to deal with that and how to um, keep performing and keep delivering good code. Uh, not sure what to do about that. Um, perhaps having gone through it once, then these group of clients will be better at doing it again. Um, I think it was interesting to see how there were kind of um, like a few little efforts or a few people that kind of poked up and really pushed things along. Um, I think Parry was really helpful. Um, uh, I think uh, Marius also um, managed to create a lot of momentum. So I think there's a lot to be said about, um, yeah, just the, I think the right person at the right time, relieving the right 
pressure point. So I don't know what we can do to, to make that happen more in the future, but those, yeah, those individuals should be enabled when they want to, when they want to do something. Um, I think it went really well. Um, I have been quite disappointed with MEV since, um, since it's launched. I know there's been, with some of the, the implementations there, there's been some bugs that we, that, with like JSON encoding that really, really shouldn't have hit us on mainnet. Um, I think it's probably because MEV, um, like we all kind of realized that that's a thing is happening quite close to the merge, didn't quite get enough time to run with it, didn't get um, enough time for it to be integrated into our setups. Um, I think there's also some catching up that those teams need to do in terms of um, announcements and comms. So if they have failures um, with their software, they need to announce it. They need to tell people instantly that there is a problem and it's being looked into, not sit on it for some time and then and then and then publish it. I was really happy that actually we we almost launched in October, so <laughs> just the next year. Um, <laughs> So, but then I came back to the, like, after I said that, I was like, yeah, maybe, maybe it was not really the common agreement, the common <laughs> sense. <laughs> and I came back to the, to the Netherminds team asking everyone, hey, do you think we can do that for October? Like, you think it's possible? At least do I have to go and just, like, tell everyone, hey, I was wrong? And they said, no, we, we think it's possible. <laughs> so I thought, like, okay, yeah. And, well, there was, there was a lot of work. But at the same time, I remember thinking on the same day, I think it was good to say it because suddenly all the infrastructure teams started calling everyone and saying, hey, like, we're launching in October, we are totally unprepared, we have to start preparing, and it was needed. Like, because we needed node operators to start looking at this, we needed the community to say, okay, there's some date for the first time. Uh, so we missed it by a lot. But, and then in Anpora, yes, I was still, still very confident uh, because I, I've seen the things progressing, I've seen the, the rayon is hitting very fast, but it was like all those small things that take so much time really and the testing and the proper testing and the confidence. Uh, and I think when I was a bit pessimistic was around April this year when I when we were thinking about MEV boost and how ready MEV boost is and how much everybody was prepared for MEV boost and I was more stressed at the time about will we have MEV boost on time or will we have to launch without MEV boost because at the time we were thinking of June or May as a, as a launch date for MEV, eh, for, for the merge. So everything came together around September. Uh, I definitely didn't want people to, to as I say, to use this difficulty bomb thing as, a, as something that would drive the dates. I, I'm talking to developers, to our team, I feel like th there's really no more motivation you can get, or no more pushing or, or shouting or asking that you could get for delivery on time. So there's absolutely no sense to introduce any other stressor. So, so the difficulty bombing moved slightly. Uh, I hoped it won't move the merge date, uh, and we didn't. Uh, so actually the merge date wasn't moved, and nobody was talking about the block times. But we would talk about the block times if it didn't happen. Nice. Um, yeah, more folks on the other side of the room. Something. Yeah. I wanted to share, uh, I guess, a different aspect of the merge. Um, so we are like one of the minor clients, uh, Bezu team. And uh, one thing I would have done differently was um, preparing for people, uh, choosing client diversity, uh, getting ready for them. Didn't realize, I guess, I think it was around like two, three weeks before the merge timeline. We saw a huge amount of people, thanks to a lot of uh, solo stakers coming through Discord, asking tons of questions. And I think the maintainers were super busy with, uh, you know, trying to get the final release out. Uh, didn't get to really respond to a lot of them. Uh, so I think that's something that, if we had to go through the merge, not really. Um, but if we had to go through it again, definitely would do that differently to be ready for um, community support. How do we get this uh, you know, new users coming through this ecosystem? Like, how can we support that better? Um, and but honestly, it's definitely a hard challenge because as maintainers, like you're really deep in the weeds of like really trying to get the code out um, on top of that, trying to support 
tons of users coming through is uh, it's, it's really challenging. But thanks to a lot of the um, contributors who also chimed in and asked, um, answering a lot of other people's questions on how to set up their validators and all that. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a community effort. It's not just the maintainers, all core devs. Um, so thank you for those uh, solo stakers coming in and asking questions and really improving the client diversity and also other contributors uh, supporting each other. So um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, I guess one last comment is, please don't threat, uh, threaten us um, <laughs> uh, minority clients by saying, oh, we're going to go to GIF. Uh, I think that's oh, yes. like a stab in your like heart and twisting it. Uh, so yeah, thank you. <laughs> Hello. Okay. So I want to double down on Paul. So I'm from Prism. And um, so from my team's perspective, perspective, Merge has always just been consensus, execution, and engineering API, and boom, done, right? And then, like, I guess, like, just a month before the Merge, we learned, okay, there's this MEV stuff we have to work on now, and then there's this MEV boost, and there's this relayer, this builder, so we just keep adding more and more actors to the picture, and then even a few weeks before the Merge, right, there, there was this tornado cache, this like old fetch stuff, and then flashbots were the only relayer. So our team had this big internal discussion. It's like, okay, should we drop the support right now? Like, like what should we do if flashbot was the only relayer and the, they are sensing transaction, right? Even though MV, MVP boost is a neutral piece of software, but flashbot is the only relayer, then as a client team, we are indirectly supporting censorship and of course, I'm not happy with that. This, this is not what we're here for, right? So I think like we learned a lot. I learned a lot. It's just like if today relayers are producing 50% of the blocks on the mainnet, are they considered as layer one, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to see there's more and more like relayers, flashbots, they're joining the Oracle dev code. They're starting to participate more on just layer one roadmap, like architecture and stuff like that. So I do think like we do have to work with them and, and they have to work with us together to basically push the space forward. Yeah, good points by um, by Terence. I think it's worth saying as well that I think even though we did have some problems with MEV and I was pretty harsh on them before, I think we did come out of it um, in a better spot than we were before. Uh, there's no like MEV geth now um, and Flashbots were really happy to, re to relinquish that, that control which was really cool um, and MEV boost um, is something that can be implemented by other people um, and even as it stands it works with other relays um, so I think we really opened up the world to MEV and although we didn't solve it and we're still not in a great spot I think we ended up in a better spot um, and I think Flashbots have done some good stuff um, towards that as well. Yeah the circuit breaker was good as well yeah so, so now there's um, the consensus client can detect when the chain is unhealthy and then just disable MEV. Um, so that's something that we couldn't really do before in MEV geth. Um, with the like MEV boot, uh, Flashbots could have implemented it, but um, you know it's a lot of work for them. Um, so yeah, now, now there's a lot more control from the consensus clients at least um, into what's going on with MEV, and I think that's that's a really good place to be in. Do do they still run Mev geth if you if they're relayers? I don't know. Actually, it's a good question. I kind of. Um, wasn't thinking about that, but yeah, because I think like you know, for the most part, most people who are running validators, they're just getting blocks from the, the either the builder or the relayer. Somebody has to run something that looks like Geth that's taking the searcher bundles together and putting them into a block format. Yeah, I guess what's hap I, if that that's still the case, it's not it's not ideal. But I guess what's better now is that every one of those gets produced is now verified by um, not that thing before it's published on the network. Right. Yeah, and I guess like from my perspective, the the whole situation with MEV was very interesting because MEV has been around for a, several years now, and you know we've kind of seen through the DeFi summer and the NFT summer th these crazy numbers about how much MEV there is in blocks. And you know, from my perspective was I was thinking, you know, there's so much money in this industry, like the solutions are just going to appear and they're going to be really robust and they're going to work. <laughs> and then, you know, it turns out that it's six, seven months before we were really projecting for the merge to happen, we're starting to realize that the solutions that we as core developers feel need to exist weren't in the place that we felt that they needed to be. And so we started trying to like help, help accelerate um, that path. And the way that it turned out, I think like it's better than it could have been. I would have been very curious to see like what, in, you know, institutions would have created their own MEV boost had this like open source public 
thing not existed because I think that there is enough money in this industry that some of these big stakers would have realized, you know, there's no way for us to extract MEV anymore. Let's create some centralized endpoint for people to send bundles to and we'll just extract it for our customers and, you know, screw all the rest of the stakers. They can figure out their own ways. So it's not where we want it to be today. We want to improve MevBoost and make it better. Uh, and we eventually want to move to PBS where it's part of the protocol. Uh, and so we're just working towards that. But I, and I think like also, you know, with respect to thinking that the MEV industry was going to build all of this stuff, the core development community is also like very anti-financialization of a lot of things. And so to a degree, it felt like we didn't want to think about it. It felt wrong for us to think about MEV in a lot of cases. And it was only later on where we realized how much interplay there was between censorship and MEV and the ability to produce blocks. And it started to just unfold very naturally over the last six to eight months. And I think like looking back, if we would have understood those things two years ago, we probably would have thought a lot harder about how to think about this with respect to the merge and maybe how to integrate some of this stuff a little bit more natively uh, in, into clients. Yeah. And I guess, um yeah, talking about like the design of the whole thing, I'm curious to hear like Proto and Mikhail, you both spent a bunch of time like early on with like the engine API and, and specking out of that. But um, yeah, Mikhail, do you want to just like walk us through like how do we come up with the merge? Like how do we, how do we get here? Yeah, hey. Uh, okay, so sorry, like for me, the merge started two and a half years ago, like roughly this moment in time and uh, yeah by that time it was like an idea of uh, the two-way bridge of bringing the um, Casper FFG as a finality gadget from the beacon chain to the um, to the proof work chain um, that uh, was the turning point and there was an idea of like actually um, uh, transitioning the proof of work chain eventually to the uh, one of the shards uh, that was um, not yet designed uh, by that time and uh, yeah, it was like a long journey. I can't recall everything that has happened uh, like during this more than two years period of time. But uh, one thing that I would just like to uh, mention here, like my key takeaway, one of the key takeaways from the working on the merge project is that uh, retrospectively, um, what what I can um, yeah recall, like the first, collaboration with other some somebody else working on the same space was uh, collaborating with Guillaume. Uh, Guillaume prototyped the, basically the first execution layer client. It was not called that uh, by that time, but anyway, it like made me much easier to like uh, prototype the whole thing, like the consensus layer uh, interacting with the execution layer. Um, it was not done by Engine API by that time, but anyway, it was like yeah, the old idea of like putting it in a shard and make it work somehow. So we did this prototype. Then, yeah, after some progress on the merge specs and then the ideas, then Proto appeared with like Rare News and Project. So just, you know, uh, forced us to make the first version of Engine API. Proto, do you remember all this enormous amount of hours you've spent managing this project and driving it through? Just like, I mean, I can talk about that. I, I would want to first reiterate over how, what the first moment in time was that we developed the merge. I think it was um, before COVID, before the whole pandemic, I think in like SBC there were still discussions about eWASM, but then less than a month later in Paris during EvoNX, discussions afterwards, eWASM or like the ID of execution charts was basically over, done for. And these discussions between you and Guillaume, Danny, me, others, Ben and also started where, hey, maybe <laughs> we can prototype this catalyst thing with the EVM attached to Teku. And uh, yeah, like, <laughs> that was kind of cool. But it took, that's 2020, it took a year, more than a year till we got to, to Rayonism. So it's a huge leap already where things happened. And then in Rayonism, we were in this awkward spot where Altair was still not shipped and London was still not shipped. And we were this like moment in time where there's this tech development where you have to convince people 
that they need to dedicate resources on something that's not the main hard fork to make some kind of progress. Definitely, like it, there there were moments in time where I was slightly like, yeah, out of my humor because of the <laughs> the way <laughs> the the these calls would go. Like for a month, we were thinking of it like a hackathon where okay, we just do the prototype with more than one client. And more than often, it just meant that some clients would not go and join these calls to even just get a, a glimpse of what we were trying to do after Altair and after London. And I think like this discovery process for future forks, we can improve. Where that's the time when if we had more people think about the merge, we could have realized that, hey, we need to make these communication channels with things like flashbots and MFE, because the mirror is very soon. <laughs> and otherwise, it's very late. Then you get in these situations. Yeah. And By the way, MEV people are going to join us for the last session, so we can discuss more of that yeah. later. Because yeah, Alex yeah, just texted me that he's coming for the last session. Cool. Unfortunately, he did not make it here. Uh, can I continue on that? Yeah, it's just a few, few, few sentences left from my end. Yeah, so after any, this is the first time we had like engaged more client developers and client development teams into that. And we had to written to write a spec of the engine API, like to make this, you know, some kind of standardized or whatever. Um, it was even before M4. It was like uh, like more than one year ago. Like yeah, yeah, April and May, when we won, yeah. It was great. So then Amphora, then um, yeah, all, all this off-chain events, uh, off-chain, sorry, off-sites, off, off, offline events, it's a really huge um, facilitator of the progress. And all the um, developers in one place uh, talking to each other in person, I think it really helps to collaborate on the things even after the event, even when we're uh, like on the internet, um, back to work. Yeah, and as, as has been mentioned, testing efforts, client developers uh, uh, gave a lot of feedback and all this stuff. I was just, and the key takeaway uh, for, from, from what has been said, um, yeah, the right people at the right moment in time make the things happen. So retrospectively, this is what has happened with the merge. Um, and I think that uh, this may only happen, uh, this kind of like thing, right? People at the right uh, moment in time appear like in the healthy community, which we have currently, the healthy community of uh, researchers and developers. And uh, yep, and this like uh, proof, uh, the merge is like, is for me, is proof of like this, um, that the this community of researchers and developers that we have in Ethereum ecosystem can like capable of uh, delivering like huge, uh, big, sophisticated projects, and like the merge is like the first one, right? So next is uh, dank sharding and other things, uh, local trees. So it's not that I'm not that scared about it after we deliver the merge <laughs> with this huge success. So thank you very much, everyone who made it. I guess um, on the note of the community, it's been like 35 minutes, that's just us talking. Um, Tim, don't we want to give oh. Lord Star um, to like oh, tell sure. us more? We can do Lord Star, but after that, start asking questions so we can like, yeah, open this up. Hey, thank you. Sorry for being late, <laughs> as we are <laughs> most of the time. Uh, we're, we are the fifth, the fifth uh, consensus client, so yeah, we, we actually produced our first block on mainnet in November of last year. But it was actually fun to basically sprint up to uh, to with everyone else and basically caught up. Um, so that sort of retrospective was uh, was amazing to see the kind of feat that we can get there. And of course, with the help of all the other client teams um, as well, we were able to pull through. So it basically goes to show that what we're capable of when we all work together, especially when we're all focused on that one thing, and it was to achieve a successful merge. So. Um, it was really great to, for all you guys to help us basically pull us up to where you guys are. Um, I guess one of the hardest things that uh, we had to deal with with being a more later client uh, to be ready for mainnet 
is really just the fact that uh, client stickiness is really, really huge issue and we definitely noticed it as we're going towards merge. People tended to not necessarily want to experiment with a new client uh, going up to something as critical as the merge. So we found that to be quite difficult, even though we, you know, tried our best to sort of make it easier for people, you know, our, like one of the best examples would have been our um, Lodestar quick scripts that we use, which is basically like a one line command for people to start up Lodestar with any of the EL clients. Um, but, you know, didn't see as much traction with that as we'd like to, but um, now that we're pretty much caught up going into withdrawals, Shanghai, dank sharding, uh, hoping to see much more adoption with that. And um, yeah, we, we definitely can't do it without the help of all of our collective minds together. So really our retrospective is um, if you are an up and coming client, um, we're all here to help you. Thanks. Yeah. So we, we've just shared kind of mostly core devs and researchers, you know, our retrospectives on the merge. So my question to, to everyone out in the community is, what's it been like? Like, what's your retrospective on how the merge has gone? How has it been as a validator? How has it been as a DAP developer and those kinds of things? Someone's got to start. Just give someone a mic. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. I'm not a dev. It was crazy because uh, in Mexico, I'm trying to teach people what Ethereum is making, what uh, people like you are building, are, are creating. And it's hard because all the terminology is very hard to understand. And the devs, uh, they don't teach people what you are doing. And guys like me that are nerds reading all the stuff, it, it's very hard to, to keep a good ch channel. But I think it's day to day, it's improving life. For example, when, when I started to make the threads about all core devs in Spanish, uh, Skylar came to me and said, hey guy, uh, nice what you, are, what you are doing. Then Tim Baker started to, to share my post, so thank you to everyone for all this. I don't know, I feel like very nervous because I think that I am with a very, very smart guys, people, <laughs> and it's like crazy bad. That day, that night where, uh, I was with the ETH Latin community uh, speaking about the merge, what it's going to do. Everybody was very, very hyped then. We saw the panda and was, okay, it's done. Let's go to sleep. <laughs> so, <laughs> so great job, guys. Great job. And thank you to everyone who's doing those translations and helping with that education. It, we can't keep up with all of it, and it, it is a community effort. It's, it's really brilliant. Uh, this might be like a random question, but can we have more documentation and resources for future core developers? Um, because I've looked around and it's very hard to find, and I myself would like to volunteer to take that task and would love to create a documentation, tutorials, and roadmaps, because uh, I really want to work on that, but it's very hard to find like a clear path to, to become a core developer. Okay, uh, this is a great um, time to give a shout out because Mario just came and he is uh, actually one of the people who leads the fellowship program for Core Devs, um, like an um, yeah, internship thank you. program uh, for thank you. Core Devs. Um, have you heard about a protocol fellowship? Uh, it's exactly answer to your question. Oh, you were, I'm sorry about that, but you can still participate. So this is the thing. So like, uh, so uh, Ethereum protocol, protocol fellowship is a, kind of an internship program where um, uh, anybody can come and wor start working on a project. And um, in a way that we, uh, it provides um, sort of mentorship from many of folks who are sitting here and, and other core devs. And uh, there are also resources. So if uh, with the, um, the whole, uh, like the, Fellowship is coordinated via a repository uh, on GitHub where uh, there is also su suggested reading. Uh, there are a few things they put together, but I agree it's not easy. It's, it's, it's a high wall that you have to go through, but so we are, I believe that this might make, make it easier. So there is, uh, there is a lot of things to dive into and uh, the, the reading in the repo can help you to look into what, what uh, makes you, uh, in, what, what, what you're interested in. And then uh, you can just start contributing uh, because so the, 
the calls and everything in the even if you are not accepted it's still open you can join uh, if you are not accepted you just don't get a stipend uh, but you can still come and and if you work on a project and over a few weeks we see that you have valuable out output uh, we can still uh, give you the stipend as well uh, but uh, it's fully permissionless you can uh, come to the calls propose idea that you want there uh, uh, there are um, calls where you can propose idea in an issue similar to ACD. Uh, that I would like to discuss this, and uh, we'll invite some of the mentors to help you with that, give you some guidance. So yeah, hopefully it can help. And if not that, then uh, Nevermind has an uh, internship uh, program as well, and uh, we have like one of our projects is also core development as well, where we we are very happy to guide you over as well. Um, yeah, we are always hiring new interns, so, I don't know, yeah, so this is like sort of like should be your base layer for where to find more core devs related or like how to be a core dev, um, <laughs> although that was kind of controversial where um, I think Lane or Amin, yeah, Amin was like, who is a core dev? So. Can I be a core dev? <laughs> who is a core dev? Um, yeah, who else? I just wanted to ask, <clears throat> will there ever, ever be a hackathon that, for this sort of thing? Um, maybe like a three-day thing, um, event where people can work on funny stuff? We should do that. Because uh, Christoph wanted to do one in like Nevermind hackathon. Uh, but it was like, it was supposed to be internal. But I'm very happy to take this over and um, do sort of like a core dev uh, hackathon. And I mean, Mario should definitely collaborate on that. If Thomas is okay with that, because he's like my boss right now, because uh, I'm leading the internship program. So, just quickly, I was going to say um, a lot of the open source repos also have tickets that are marked good to start development on. So um, that's another avenue. It does get taken up by contributors, and we review and give feedback and help. And so there are a few avenues, but it is a big. It's a learning curve. <laughs> Um, so, we were working this weekend on the ETH Bogota on some hypothesis regarding the new proof of, uh, proof of stake system. And one question we really couldn't get answered was now with the new proof of stake system, is how the, box, the blocks get built, is it still purely an economical incentive as where they choose the highest fees for the, or the highest prices to include in the blocks? Or are there still other incentives include, included as there's an increased risk of slashing? So the, the block building doesn't really lead to the slashing risk. Slashing risks are only uh, related to the double signing, like signing two different blocks or attesting to two different blocks or proposing two conflicting blocks or attesting to conflicting blocks. Uh, so they yeah, it it's, should be economical incentive. It should be a land incentive, something that is very natural. So the block builder is looking for the payout and collects the transactions that are paying the most. Uh, plus, there might be any not clearly economical, not financial, but still quantifiable benefits. Right. So Thomas is right about slashing. Uh, there are inactivity penalties, which are often confused with slashings which you can incur if you miss your proposal. And for example, if the latency is very high because you're using an external block builder service. Um, so that's one incentive for people to use lower latency services, which should just be your or not. But I do think that that's part of the whole MFE discussion on how we make home stakers are competitive with regular stakers when it comes to publishing blocks so that they get attested timely and they're not missed. And larger blocks, obviously, they, they, are, they cost more bandwidth, they cost more time to propagate. So that might play a role. Thank you. I just wanted to... I was just going to circle back very quickly to the question about how to be a core developer. And I wanted to say that there's, I think there's two things to consider. The first is 
just follow all core devs to the best of your ability. I think orienting oneself around like what's actually happening in the protocol starts to make it a lot clearer like where are places that you can contribute to. So doing that, and then I haven't talked to a core developer in a long time who doesn't have a long laundry list of things that they would love to happen that they just simply don't have enough hours in the day to do. So maybe once you're feeling more oriented with the direction of the protocol, to try and just reach out to a core developer and say, hey, you know, this is my skill set, this is where I'm coming from, uh, you know, do you have a project in mind that I might be able to help with? And I think like once you start doing a little bit of that and showing that there's, like you're creating value, then core teams love hiring people. So this is, uh, this is what I would recommend. I'll add a, a tiny note on that uh, about like following all core devs. Um, as the guy who runs it, the first like six months of so, it was my job to attend all core devs. I just like didn't understand anything that was happening. And like, I was literally like too intimidated to like speak up. So like, if that's your feeling, um, that's normal. And if you're smarter than me, it'll probably not last six months, but like, it, there's a lot of just like implied context that, I don't know, it's really hard. And I felt really good about myself when Danny Ryan told me the same thing. When he started, I think before he started the EF, he would attend the Casper CBC calls and he would just share links in the Zoom chat. He was telling me, like, you know, when somebody was like, oh, like this paper came out, he would just like Google it and be the first guy to share the link in the Zoom chat. So like, yeah, the calls are like hard to, there's not like a good way to dive into it. I haven't found somebody. Um, so if you're like, if it feels weird for a while, uh, that's, that's kind of normal. Um, I have, I, when people ask me questions, I always throw in these like, random ideas. I think this is a good idea. Just be extremely obsessed with like ETH research forum and to a point where that you read the forum one, two, three times and then take notes to like, like basically where the notes that you can understand. Then you can transfer notes into blog posts and then you can share the blog posts to people. And then, but, but when you are able to do that, you, you, like you can actually be fairly, you can actually be very knowledgeable at that topic already, which, yeah. And then another thing is like just, just podcasts in general, like pay, just like pay attention to like core podcasts and then take notes on that. And then also share your notes. Just people will actually appreciate that because not, because not a lot of people have time to watch like YouTube videos and listen to podcasts and stuff. People will prefer to read notes. And just make sure to share everything on Twitter. That's where, <laughs> That's where the hype is and that's like how you can like get involved and go to events and just like speak up or even take notes and then like even DM to people that's like how you can basically get started. Also great way how to get even closer to the people in the Ethereum is just volunteer on a conference. That's basically how many people in the ecosystem including me started and I feel like that's the way how you can get even closer and whether that's like volunteering on a conference itself or you can just even volunteer on a call. And you can like find like a client calls and then just like hey like I want to take notes or like this is my skill set and like this is how I want to help you or like I found a bounty uh, like I found a bug in your code or something or just like get involved with the GitHub repos. Yeah, I'd 100% agree. Hi, I'm Christine. Um, I'm a researcher at Galaxy. But on the topic of ETH core dev calls. I too definitely did not understand anything for like the first couple years of my time covering these calls, but it takes a while. Um, I think one thing that I thought was really interesting about covering the merge and being on these, like watching through live stream over the years that it took to kind of like get the merge going is how over time, like the process for figuring out what goes into the merge and who gets to build clients for the merge increasingly become like a smaller and smaller and smaller team. Um, so like in the beginning, there was like, probably there was like, there's this article on Coindesk talking about like how there's like eight or nine different client teams like trying to build for the merge, but a lot of them dropped off once like, I think there was a point in which like the, the repo for how Ethereum's consensus was gonna happen got like totally overturned and that made a lot of client teams mad. And so then it like shrank down to four. And I think the closer, like the client teams got to to the merge, it was very it was very clear that like there there wasn't like really much more discussion to be had from like just anybody. So like when the Discord channel was like privatized, like basically like no one talked because we really have to focus on the merge right now. And 
when there started to become like differences of like client teams readiness for the merge. So like some client teams were more ready than others, had more features ready than others. I think there, the differences between like preparation and resources for each client teams got a lot clearer, like the closer it came to the merge. Um, so I think like moving forward and looking ahead to some of the other bigger upgrades, um, I guess like I wanted to know your guys' thoughts on how to like, on basically what the new process is going to be for EIPs and stuff. Because like for the ETH core dev calls for the last couple of months, it's been clear that it's just the merge. But now like there's going to be so much to discuss, so much about Ethereum's roadmap. Um, so I thought that it was like really like part of the, the whole topic around like ossification. Like the more decentralized this process is, the harder it is to make changes. Um, but Clearly, there's like some amount of centralization that's needed and that we've already seen to make the merge possible. And so now there's Shanghai coming up. So like, will it still be like consensus layer, execution layer, like calls? Or how are we thinking about governance, I guess, moving forward to, to, to start to like, um, yeah, pull off some of the other big, big, big roadmap items? Yeah. Well, there's a lot to unpack in there. Um, I think a short, really short answer is like slowly iterating from what we have. Like I think just like the merge itself was kind of a, a feat of governance to some extent to get like nine client teams to work together um, and agree on like, uh, like agreeing on the big stuff was easy for the merge. I think everybody wanted to do it. Um, uh, like all the tiny things, I don't know, I have the latest valid hash like burnt into my head from typing it in the core devs agenda. Um, like it's just like this thousand tiny things where it's like the coordination was really hard. Um, I think the other thing is like, and, and we're about to get into this, I guess, it's like balancing like large protocol changes, so something like the merge, something like sharding, something like stateless with like smaller things that like bring it out of value as well. I, I think this is where most of the tension probably arises, like different prioritizations there. I think, so I'm curious to hear from Dan Crowd out there. Dan Crowd, you have like some like more radical views about the process than me, so yeah. And you haven't spoken so far, so I think this is a good, it's a good cue for you. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's a big jump, but yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> um, I mean my, my view on all core devs, I mean, like, I mean, uh, I, th I think the big thing that I I feel is missing and that I want to see is um, representation of like Ethereum's users <coughs> and the whole community, rather than it mostly being focused around one side of the of the um, of Ethereum, which is the development. Um, and I think that's uh, that's a big thing, and we would b see very interesting and different proposals if we had more voices like that on the call. Also, the IP process is being um, like. It's being improved uh, over time, and right now, what like not like we, but the AIP IP group is working on, and uh, alongside with uh, Ethereum cat holders, uh, is pretty much that they are going to like sort of fork or like separate the core AIPs from the other uh, ERCs and like other different <laughs> AIPs, uh, and then eventually, what's up? Yeah. Uh, oh. Okay. Uh, you can just say yes. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah uh, but like, I remember like we've been talking with like Tim and some other, even like Hudson. I think you yeah. were there in the group, where we wanted to separate e, uh, ERCs from the EIPs. Uh, oh, <laughs> Jesus! I mean, okay. also Hudson, we we did not use the stage because we want to like be everybody on the same. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, so pretty much, we wanted to separate ERCs from uh, EIPs, but then it ended up. What ended up happened is that we ended up uh, sort of separating core EIPs from the rest of the EIPs. That's exactly right. And um, there's been <laughs> there's been years and years of debate over whether to separate EIPs from ERCs, and a lot of it. The biggest problem I'm finding looking back is that there wasn't a steward to be an ERC editor. I mean, there are also EIP editors already, but there are like two or three people at this point. Yeah, and, and Micah doesn't want to do ERCs anymore. Like He's been open about that. I mean, yeah, there was like many people that wanted to sort of do it. I was even like 
one of the people that wanted to like do it myself on behalf of magicians, but then like I don't know. It kind of fizzled. Yeah, there was there was yeah. like miscommunication. There was like a lot of different problems. But either way, I'm glad that it's getting separated now. That's going to make things less confusing when people talk about EIPs. And especially as Ethereum is POS. Uh, because back in like, I think we had this discussion and uh, like with Marius, right, at the Amsterdam, where we started talking about how the EIP pro process was going to look like, and that was like April this year. Um, and all I basically pretty much got as answer was that it will be consensus driven. Um, so not not AIP process as we are used to right now, which is by the way described in the AIP one, which you guys can find on uh, eips.ethereum.org. Um, yeah, I, can I say one more quick thing on the EIPs? I, I guess it's like worth separating like the tools from the process. Like sure, you know, like we can split out the RCs and uh, I'm, I'm very bullish on like executable specs for, for the con execution. I, like there's a bunch of like mechanical changes we can do to the process and, and I think they'll be better. But that's different from like how do we actually come to consensus on the thing? Like whether it's an EIP or the yellow paper or like a consensus spec PR, um, you know, that's just like a marginal difference. I think that, so one thing I actually really don't like about all core devs is that it's calls. Um, <laughs> like my, like, and, and the reason for that is like um, calls are hard because for, they optimize for a bunch of weird things. So like they optimize for people who are awake at the time, who are like uh, good English speakers, who like are very like eloquent and like can like think on their feet and and like respond live during the call. Um, and I think this, and, and also they're like not very scalable. We can't have like 90 people on a call. Um, and so like to your point about like having more more of like the community involved, it's like that's something where like moving, the calls are good because they give like a forcing function and like some rhythms, like I wouldn't take them away completely, but moving to be like more async is something I've like, I try to think a lot about. And you know, so for Shanghai, we have like this uh, tag on, on East Magicians and like, you know, anyone can tag their EAP there, client devs can review it. Like I can't force client devs to like look at your EIP if they don't want to, like, you know, you, you, no one can do that. But it's like, at least there's a list and they can scroll through it. And like, if it sounds good to them, it might be like more accessible. And maybe you wrote it, you know, at 9 a.m. Vietnam time rather than like 4 a.m. during our core, dev, our core devs. So yeah, I, I think more async is like one actual tech, like thing we can do to make the process more open. Um, yeah. Into it. You don't have to like okay. 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 Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. What, what's the next topic? Surge, verge, verge, all the okay. big yeah, stuff. So, 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 so now that we've uh, talked about how we are going to uh, to come to consensus on these new upgrades and new things, we could maybe talk about the new upgrades and new things. What's that's your favorite new that, upgrade, that, Marius? That's enough segue for you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Marius, beautiful. what's your favorite new upgrade? Um, uh, I, I, I like four, 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 eight, four, four, um, that, that's, that's pretty nice. Um, okay, maybe, okay, a better question on, like, the new upgrades. Um, I guess I'm curious, like, yeah, from, from client team's perspective, like, how much have you been thinking about new upgrades? Because like everyone on Twitter obviously talks about 4844. A bunch of people not in client teams have been contributing. A couple of in client teams have as well. But like you know, mostly like we shipped the merge a month ago. Um, you know, like it's not a lot of time. Um, so yeah, how are you all thinking about like what's next, or are you trying to not think about it as much as possible and you know decompress from the merge? Yeah. So. I kind of think our main responsibility is our users right now, and uh, so uh, we have a bunch of upgrades coming up that, oh yeah, okay, hi. Um, uh, we have a, we have a, so for Geth, at least from my perspective for Geth, uh, it's the most important thing is the current network. And it's not the it's not the future, and it's not uh, this. It wasn't the merge, and um, we want to make sure that uh, the current network runs, and the current network doesn't go down, and it's secure, and it's uh, usable, and it's uh, decentralized, and you can run your own node. Um, so uh, we have a bunch of uh, other things coming up to improve. Uh, things about uh, around the database in Geth, uh, the 
the the state uh, the the way we store the state, and um, so yeah, I'm I'm really excited about those, and because we've been focusing kind of focusing on those, we haven't focused too much on the upcoming EIPs. Um, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Like in general, the team. Uh, I, I I personally also like I I started implementing 4844 in Lighthouse. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> did did uh, wrong wrong client, uh, but uh, it, it was a it was a learning experience, and I I also worked a bit on the Casey Jesus ceremony because that was just interesting to me. Um, we we I think Geth is in a fortunate position that we have a lot of outside contributions. Uh, so people actually, if they if they propose an EIP, they usually implement it in Geth. And so when when like the fork time rolls around and we have to uh, 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 have the implementations for the EIPs, uh, we have something to build on, and um, we are in a very good position there compared to other client teams. And uh, so we can kind of focus a bit more on. Uh, testing, uh, making sure that the spec is correct, uh, all of these uh, things. I, I, I think I drifted very far from the question. <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, how we feel about upgrades. Um, I think we're generally keen. I think uh, definitely keen for withdrawals, which uh, Mark is working on. Um, I, I kind of feel like the merge is not really finished until we have them in. We kind of have a bit of an outstanding promise that we're yet to fulfill to the stakers. Um, so definitely keen to get that one in um, without even saying like, you know, what do you want to do after the merge? Because it's not really after the merge for me until we've done that. Um, yeah, so keen to work on that, keen to get that in soon. Definitely keen to get 4844 in. I think that looks really cool. Um, personally, not super keen to rush it. I think it'd be nice to have uh, a bit of time, like Myros was saying, to kind of watch the network, um, breathe. Um, yeah, so definitely keen for upgrades. We, we, sorry? Watch the corridors, breathe. Oh, the network. Also the corridors. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we, we have, um, like, Sean's been working on it. Um, Maris has been working on it for Lighthouse. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got to put in your timesheet, man. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're keen. I'll uh, perhaps pass it to Teku. Yeah, I think I really support Paul's point on the, the next thing we do is withdrawals. Like, it's got to be done. I, I don't think it's reasonable to put in bigger things that are then going to delay getting withdrawals out. We made a promise. We shirked on the promise a bit, and you were all very forgiving because we got the merge sooner. And now we're going to deliver the promise. We've, we've got to come through on that. Um, but I think the thing that really comes after the merge is the user support for the merge and the optimization and the cleanup and the learning now that we're actually seeing it in the real world for real. There's a whole heap of stuff that we can now go, oh, we should make this better. And it's not going to be protocol upgrades. It's just client improvements and so on. So that's going to take a good chunk of time. But I think we can um, start looking at a bunch of other things as well. And so I think 4844 is probably getting the, the lion's share of attention of the next big thing after withdrawals. Yeah, I think that withdrawals are absolutely must and absolutely the most important thing to deliver. At the same time, 4844 sounds so interesting that it starts to steal the thunder. And and I think this maybe if it, even it's it's a bit dangerous. We should. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very brave man sitting between Frodo and Brave, Dan, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so yeah, that's that's why it's so interesting because <laughs> people are, are so convincing in delivering those visions. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, coming back to how how Nethermind's team thinks about the next deliveries, I almost would like to to activate Daniel here to tell about his like plan of of delivering that. So I think it's, uh, in our case, very similar what I just heard from other teams. So we right now would like to relax a little bit and focus on improving our client. Yeah. So the marriage was extremely stressful, to be honest, for the whole team. And uh, now people want to do things that, you know, in a, let's say, slower, a slower pace. Yeah. And additionally, we would like to clean up a little bit, yeah, because there was no time. Um, I know I don't know if you are aware, but like never mind. A few months ago, it was completely different uh, a team. It was undersized, very small, 
At some point, there was only one guy, Marek, working on the merch, which was crazy. And you know, I was really sorry when I joined and I uh, you know, uh, <laughs> met Marek and I said, OK, we have to do something with that. And yeah, now it's, we are in a completely different state. Uh, we can you know, improve our client a lot. We have a lot of things that actually we are excited about. And they are not, you know, I would say, one-to-one -one related to, to Shanghai. These are the things like you mentioned, yeah, like database improvement our sync improvement, you know, our robustness of the client. These are the things that maybe are not so excited, exciting for the community, but they're exciting for us. And that's what we are mostly are talking about right now. And there are also things like, you know, documentation, uh, community support, user support. These are things that didn't work well in the past. And I think in general, it should be improved, not only in Nethermind, but in the whole community. Yeah? Uh, so this is what actually excites us right now. And in terms of uh, particular IPs, we already started, you know, investigations, but, you know, taking it slowly, you know, have fun with it, like 4844, you know, there is one guy working from our team, that's, I see that he's really excited about it, that's cool. There is, we already started to, with, with Ravels, we have some kind of draft implementation, and we know that maybe it's going to change, but, yeah, why not to start playing with it? So yeah, in general, yeah, we are in much better state than we used to be, and yeah, this is what we are doing right now. Thanks. So, uh, yeah, I can give you uh, an additional perspective from a minority client like Lodestar. We're pretty much in the same boat, I guess, with like Nethermind, where before, like, at a point where we haven't even hired the people that you guys have at this point. So in terms of time, we really haven't had as much time to really think too, too far ahead. We're getting most of the stuff from, you know, you guys in, in the community and such. But uh, technical debt is definitely a huge thing for us as well. We have a lot of documentation we need to update, stuff like this, which, um, you know, it would be nice to have a, a sprint that's just, you know, for technical debt and, and, and getting our client up uh, to, to par in that sense. Um, but that's, you know, we're really excited, of course, to implement all the upcoming stuff um, in the roadmap. Um, like, this was great for me because I haven't even spec'd out 4844 as much as I should yet. So that's, you know, where we're at, basically. So on the Nimbus side, um, there is a delicate balance between uh, implementing new things that are still uh, moving targets and uh, doing things that are expecting from client teams like testing and trying not to introduce regressions. Uh, like we had a lot of um, point release in the past three weeks before the merge and that took like all of our focus. But we do like um, implementing new things as well. For example, we uh, took the lead with Lodestar on the light client thing. So this is something that we will continue. Uh, but we didn't start at all on anything related to uh, the surge, the verge, uh, the purge, and the splurge. Well, uh, we did try to uh, look into KZG commitments, but they changed uh, a lot in the past two years. So everything has to be thrown out and uh, recoded. I, I also think it's fine for uh, the smaller clients to not be on the like brink of research um, because the especially with these uh, with these upgrades like like for it for four right now the spec will change uh, a lot and uh, it I think it just doesn't make sense for for smaller client teams um, that have that need to focus on like getting their client up to speed um, to also uh, think about the research and and the iteration on the spec. So I think that's something that we did with uh, with the merge pretty pretty well. Is there was like the bigger client teams, uh, Geth, Lighthouse, Prism, um, uh, Nethermind, Bisu, iterating on the iterating on the spec, and the the other clients um, kind of uh, like 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 following a bit. And um, I think that's a good way for the teams that have more funding, more people, um, to take some of the load away from the other teams. And also that's also what we're trying with, uh, with uh, testing uh, and, and the Ethereum Foundation testing team, uh, where we're currently looking for new people. So if you're interested in testing, uh, come talk to me or Mario uh, Vega. Um, <laughs> 
Yes. So we we, we want to con completely revamp uh, the way we do state tests um, to make it really really easy for 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 people to to implement state tests and uh, uh, to, to take some load of of, of the the client teams. I just wanted to share from a small client perspective. So for Besu, honestly, the past month has been as equally hectic as preparing for the merge um, um, with a bunch of um, major fixes um, for bug fixes. So honestly, we haven't even thought of future um, EIPs. Honestly, I think we even haven't gotten a chance to rest. Um, and a lot of the maintainers couldn't make it because they're still working really hard, working on the fixes. Some even donated some of their paternity leave to work on the fixes. Um, so quite, quite intense. Um, uh, but I think afterwards we'll um, hopefully get some time to rest and get all the maintainers together, uh, talk through what's going to be the future um, you know, um, works that we want to work on. What really resonated me personally with the earlier talks by Aya was the subtraction part. So I, I'm hoping that as maintainers we get to see which part of our code base could we actually subtract. I think we're still talking about what EIPs are we going to add and add and add to our code base. Um, but I think there's going to be some like future, um, like you know, tech, not future, like tech debt from the past to clear out to modularize uh, um, the the product itself. And so looking into a lot of um, I would say client improvement is. Currently, where I see maintainers are talking a lot about, but yeah, definitely would um, would have to come talk about EIPs. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm Prism, and um, I think withdrawal is, is important, but it's also on the easier side. And on the EIP 4444, we have been lucky, and Optimism and then Coinbase have been contributing to our code base. So thank you for that. But I do want to throw like a curveball. I think like. Censorship resistance is equally as important as 4844 and withdraw. I just look at MEV watch info and 47% of the blocks are under OFAC compliance right now. So 47% of the blocks on mainnet all have some sort of censorship resistance built into it, right? So I do think like there's something like before full PBS, there's definitely something that we can do to make it better. We do have some hybrid PBS we can do. We can leverage the builder API. We can iterate very fast. We can have some math boost, CR this type of thing. And Vitaly's latest research post does point us to some nice um, direction. And Burnout B also has a nice research post as well. So I'm very excited for that. And I definitely, definitely want to prioritize right now. Uh, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to uh, teams who are, talk about wanting time to, uh, to work on their client and handle their technical backload. And I thought that, that uh, 4844 and withdrawals was a really good example of, they both kind of individually look like, okay, we've got kind of an idea of how these two things are gonna work. But, and then putting them in the same fork actually does increase complexity uh, for you know minor technical reasons. I, I guess you know we're talking about uh, switching the forking based on a block number to based on timestamp. And you know the the more uh, places that you have to change in the code base, uh, the the more work that's going to be right. So 4844 introduces a new tra transaction type, which means you know more places that this forking based on timestamp has to has to happen. For example, so just an interesting place of seeing why you might get pushback on hey let's only do one major thing in this next you know, fork instead of two and, and leave room for maintenance. So so just that as an example for this, I actually implemented the forking based on timestamps for Shanghai, which was like uh, a 20 line change. And uh, I looked into uh, doing the same thing for, uh, sorry, for, for, for withdrawals, not for Shanghai. Um, and I looked into doing the same thing for 4844 and it would be like, 70 different files that I would need to touch just for changing the um, uh, changing the way we we verify the signatures and, and the signer. So um, it's individually it's 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 okay, but together it it creates uh, even more complexity. I, th I feel like we've heard a lot of clients say that they th feel that. They could spend some time cleaning things up in their code base, improving you know improving things in their code base. 
And I'm just curious to hear from Tim and from other clients, like how should we think about this in respect to the roadmap and all the things we want to do? Because it seems like we're consistently saying we need to ship withdrawals yesterday, we need to ship 4844 three months ago, vertical trees, all of these things. And it's not clear to me how to do that and balance and you know, maintaining clients for the long term. So while well, well, we say that we want to slow down, at the same time, I think that Nedamite is ready to, to think like a big client, like the one that is, uh, that is leading the effort on the exploration. So, so by the fact that we have the large team, uh, we can both keep cleaning the technical debt, but also participate in the research and prototyping. Uh, so so we've, we've, seen, we've heard that from Mikhail can, uh, talking about, is Mikhail still there? No. no. OK. Um, so, so you're talking how, how much it was helpful to have the prototype from Guillaume, right? And, and how much Marius's experimentations were, were pushing f things forward. Um, so you have those excited people like Alexei you now and never mind, and they, they want to explore, they want to experiment, and this should help everyone to, to push things forward. And, and these deliveries are critical, and they're still time critical. I'll be doing that in parallel. Even if the field will be, we, we change the style, uh, that, that we do that a bit more mature way. I think that maturity will come also from the learning, from the merge, and from the team being larger. So I think on average the teams grew by like two to three times in the last two years on many of the uh, clients' teams, which means that we should be able to ship faster uh, than in the past. And when we look at the last two years comparing to the 2018-19, uh, we've seen that, we've seen that pace. And there is much more experience with the teams. Uh, people delivered so much during the merge, and they, they are interested in now delivering the things that they wanted to work on the side. And many of those things that they wanted to work on the side are the EIPs, are the, are the items that are interesting, like 4844, right? Uh, so this will happen. I think this will happen. But it's also the, another factor that we need to consider, yeah? But like changing, let's say, 10 lines of code or 17 files two years ago was completely different than changing the same amount of files right now. The code base is much bigger, the complexity is much uh, bigger, and you know, sometimes you know, small change uh, requires you know, days or maybe weeks of you know, research yeah, and testing and testing, especially testing, yeah, it's something that uh, we need to improve. And so yeah, the teams grow, grew, but at the same time, it takes much, I think it's gonna take much, much time to deliver similar change as the ones in the past. Um, if I can add something as a non-client. Um, <laughs> the, right now, testing is not much, or like the experience with testing is not much better than the experience introducing an EIP. I think we need a, a better platform to discuss, like the bottlenecks of Ethereum, to understand the, like, the complexity of syncing of disk I.O. and so on. And tools like Hive, they are just as stagnant sometimes as the clients themselves when it comes to making changes or improvements. And maybe we're talking about awkward enough changes. Maybe we should have like a regular breakout for testing. Maybe we should have more of this platform to discuss how we get out of this this tech debt into a place where we can be excited about new EIPs. So, so one thing about Hive is that it's currently maintained by the guest team, and we're slowly transitioning this over to the testing team. So Mario wrote a lot of Hive tests for the merge, basically all, all of the Hive tef uh, tests for the merge. And uh, so, as I said, we're trying to increase, uh, we're trying to ramp up the size of the testing team within the Ethereum Foundation, and that should take some load away. Hey. I like that the Ethereum Foundation is helping, but I don't think the right solution is to limit it to one team. No, I agree. So I think as like an open call to anybody, if you are a testing team and like you want to work on this stuff, ping Danny Ryan and he will answer you any hour or day, any minute of any hour of every day about improved testing capacity. And I think, like, I agree, it's like a huge bottleneck. I, to be fair, I feel like the merge, we did like an amazing job there, like relative to what it was before. Like when we shipped 1559, I was like, not 
hundred percent confident. I was like, and then <laughs> when the merge went live, I, you know, like I was expecting some operator to mess it up, but not like the network to break. Like it, it felt like the testing was like super robust. Um, and 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 the the challenge. The challenge, I think, with shipping all of like this complicated stuff is often not like, not just that it's hard, but it's like it changes the shape of the network. Like it's easy to add a new opcode, right, and write tests for it. Like we have framework for that, and now we ha and and but like if you want to do something like blobs, um, we we don't have like blob testing, right? And so we're going to need to build all that. Um, and then, then we'll have it, and it'll be easier to like, you know, grow the size of blobs or something. But then when we're going to want to do, I don't know, like data availability sampling, you need like, you need like always to build the new testing stuff. Um, and it's kind of hard because like you can't build it in advance because you need, you need to test something. Um, so there's this weird like chicken and egg, but I do think like, like we were having the same conversation in 2018 in Osaka and like our capacity was like 25% probably of this. So it's like, it, it, I feel we've, we have gotten better. I don't know that it's ever going to feel better doing the work, which is maybe my thing. It's like, we just do more, we're better at it, but it still feels like we're kind of pushing ourselves because like, it's just hard stuff and you need to build it. Um, and yeah, like, I mean, you know, to, to touch on 4.4.4, obviously client teams are kind of tired you know, want to take a break, want to focus on withdrawals, but like having optimism had step up, having Coinbase step up, like we wouldn't even be talking about 444 if this hadn't happened. And I'm not convinced that like four years ago, it would have been possible for like, there were no L2 teams, but like, you know, for like the plasma team to like ship something like that. So yeah, I think we're making progress. I don't know that's ever going to feel better is my rough feeling. So Adrian from Tokyo, I just moved from over there. Um, <laughs> so for context, um, so I think the other factor that's slightly interesting is there's this real cycle to doing hard forks in that client teams in particular get swamped. It's not really early on. The research team probably gets swamped first, then the client teams get swamped. And then our work is done and we're kind of waiting on coordination. And there's this lull. And that lull is where we get all of our client optimizations and all the other stuff kind of done. Um, oh, and uh, yeah, so that's real opportunity, and, and a lot of the community coordination happens there. There's, there's a lot of time it takes to go from the code is ready and done to the code is tested in every possible situation, and we've automated all of that in terms of the cross-client stuff and, and the, the level of detail we want for Ethereum. And then the code is actually ready from the community's perspective and all the tools have updated and so on. And all of those kind of have to happen in sequence. So as long as we don't shoot for a massive hard fork, we can get a, a you know, little hump of, we can get, you know, say, withdrawals done because they're relatively simple, pick up a lull, and then be ready to, to pick up something big again. Um, so it's not a case of stop the world. It's just managing those cycles. Um, and probably the other factor is that teams go through that kind of cycle as well, that you'll have a great team and you're going well and then someone will get a better job offer somewhere and you're kind of, suddenly you've got fewer people on your team and you're rebuilding with some new people again and yeah, all the client teams are nodding, we've all done it, it happens on every team from time to time. It just depends where you are in that cycle as to <laughs> how freaking out you are about the next hard fork as well. I don't know. Um, I was expecting to come and try and like make a, a pitch for why it's crazy to do more than just withdrawals as, as a big thing in, in the first hard fork after the merge, but actually I've not heard a single core dev advocate for that so far, so, oh, but maybe Dan Crow. <laughs> oh no, I moved within arm reach of the optimism Who's the core guy. Dev, That's the question. Anyway, um, but I did, I did want to ask two um, points about withdrawals, um, like mostly to consensus clients. Um, so the, the first point is, um, a few people have said things like, oh, it's a relatively small change. And so my, my, I wanted to just check, like, is it? So, um, uh, so in one of the other sessions recently, one of the points that was made uh, was that um, you know at the at the time that the um, uh, withdrawals become enabled, also um, withdrawal key rotation becomes available. So there's going to be an enormous queue of people wanting to do key rotation. There's going to be massive MEV from those val uh, validators who are trying to exit before. Um, they get hacked because their keys have been compromised over the last two years. All kinds of other sort of maybe things we haven't thought about very much. Um, so, do those worry people at all, or, or not at all? Um, and the second point I wanted to raise about withdrawals was around 
whether uh, kind of links to the tech debt point that a few people have mentioned is, uh, is there is there a, a kind of significant um, quantity of tech debt around the deposit process? So, <laughs> so as, as, as withdrawals, the proposal exists is to create a new operation for withdrawals. It's, it's not a transaction, it's, it's a completely separate type of uh, thing. Um, it seems quite natural. You might want to just have a corresponding deposit operation, clean up the deposit contract, deal with the issues like kind of you know, double counting issuance, all this kind of stuff um, that would make the protocol more understandable for future generations. Is, is anyone interested in that or I, is that f for later? <laughs> I heard some good arguments about cleaning up the deposit contracts to keep the supply in the balances actually matching what the expectations rather than locking up or like burning the, <laughs> the deposits and then minting through withdrawals. So that's fair. I do think deposits are user initiated and withdrawals are system initiated, so they're fundamentally different. But, but yes, there's a lot of tech debt there, and yes, we will fix it in a in a hard fork at some point. Um, just just to simplify, like it's it's ridiculous. The beacon chain is still voting on what it sees as the ETH one head after the merge, and it's eight thousand blocks behind. <laughs> But hey, it works, right? And we didn't have to touch it, and that was good. But we will have to fix that. I'm curious to hear from the 4844 maxis. <laughs> so the thing about 4844 is, is it's this complement to proof of stake in the whole dream of serenity. So we're very motivated to ship it. At the same time, I think there are goalposts and like the communication about the state of Ethereum are not that clear. And so I'd like a better platform for testing. I'd like testing to be less stagnant. I'd like to contribute to testing. And often I see that some of the test tooling are locked into either a research team or the GAF team of Hive. And if we open these things more like up and we communicated and had calls about these things, I would I think we can make a lot more of this quick progress towards the states where we're happy to, to work on Ford for four other complex upgrades. Um, yeah, I want to share my perspective on it as well. I think like we have heard a lot about tech debt, this is, which is like fair. These, the, the, the devs here, like they have the best overview of that and that is like uh, a very important point, of course. Um, but I think we also have a different kind of debt, which is like right now we cannot serve the vast majority of people who might want to use Ethereum. So like I think like it illustrates my point from earlier that um, we are having these discussions among core devs and they are good and they are important, but somehow uh, they can't be the only input into the decision making um, so I don't want to clearly say, like, I can't say, like, we have to do 4844 as part of uh, Shanghai. Uh, but personally, I would love to see it. And um, I think there are very good reasons to try to do it. And, um, and I think, like, only looking at the tech debt and saying, like, we can't do it because of this and we need to do everything in sequence um, is, is not enough, in my opinion, in, in arguing against it. Like, it's, um, it's, uh, we, we have to, like, at some point also start seeing the other side, like, okay, so what what is the consequence of not doing it like my fear like of course like if we have say shanghai for we managed to do it in february and then we can do like uh, for it for few, for a few months later okay like everyone's happy with that but like what happens if actually shanghai does not happen in february it happens in june it happens in september or something and 4844 slips into 2024. I think, I mean, I would be fairly unhappy with that. So, like, we should consider these scenarios and we should also think about what it means to Ethereum. Yes, it's like, it's a bear market now, so maybe we don't have these high fees as pressing, pressing an issue anymore. But I think they are still actually a pressing issue because right now maybe, like, we don't feel the pain as much because our, the things that we have been doing are fine, but still a lot of applications are not being built because the fees are too high and because they can't, like, the experimentation can't happen because I can't, like, do some fun stuff if things cost one dollar per transaction, which I could do if it's one cent per transaction. So I think, like, we should, like, be more willing to, like, think about this part as well and I would love to like understand how we can also like get that in that thinking into our governance pro uh, process as well. So uh, 
currently we are releasing uh, hard forks uh, basically when it's ready. So the more things we put inside, uh, the longer it, it takes to be ready because of uh, testing, for example. So if we actually do withdrawals, uh, which are supposedly simple, although uh, the talk from yesterday uh, <laughs> was uh, less reassuring regarding that, um, we can, yeah, maybe in February we can have withdrawals and then uh, for it for, uh, for the next one. But if we put both together, uh, maybe it will be only in June. Um, so uh, there is a balance there. So I guess one question there is like, do you think it's so possible to have a uh, one fork in uh, February and then another one like literally three or four months later? We did Berlin <laughs> no. and London with four months. Okay. I mean, it's <laughs> okay, let's, uh, I mean, one, I mean, this is like a discussion, but just like one other thing I wanted to add just like to what Dan Grad said is like thinking about it from the perspective of tech debt of layer two protocols and of rollups, right? Like the, yeah, one of the kind of philosophical goals of 4844, I think, was to kind of be a, yeah, like the change, uh, the change to end all changes uh, sort of for, uh, specifically for layer twos in the sense that 4844 introduces stuff like the point evaluation pre-compile and the concept of blobs. And it, that allows layer twos to kind of set their code once and they can literally write their code and launch it. And then, you know, no matter how much we screw around with the yeah, sharding design later, as long as we kind of screw around within certain parameters, rollups will be able to just kind of, you know, breathe easy and know that, you know, they don't have to make like that kind of re-architecting again, right? So I think there's, uh, you know, there's also value in trying to like, get that phase done earlier because you know the earlier they yeah, they can do those uh, th those kinds of changes that you know the more they can get to the phase where like you know they can start clearing instead of they have to know that like they have to clear eventually and that's just I mean, it's so worth talking to layer two teams about that too i mean i'm sure they'll have their own perspectives so i guess we there is kind of consensus that we want for it for four and withdrawals within the next nine months let's say so the question becomes both together or uh, withdraw first and then fight for four. And so, <laughs> planning team. I, I will say one of the added challenges is that the specs for 4844 and Capella are not unified. So, like, he's working on 4844, I'm working on Capella, and that's going to be a hell of a pull request <laughs> to try to merge these things and test them. Um, so, they're kind of already written like they're separate. Just. So one thing I would add with regard to hard forks one versus two is that generally with the hard forks, uh, implementing something takes usually less time than rolling it out. So uh, implementing both withdrawals and 4844 in the same hard fork definitely makes it longer, but I think overall it would still be shorter than doing two hard forks because you have a... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So, so essentially, um, I think rolling out the hard fork always takes two to three months of just, well, every client is, yeah, I'm not done yet, let's test it, tests are not done yet, okay, let's do a hard fork, this test not hard fork, that's that, that test not. So we kind of, I don't necessarily want to say we suck at rolling out things, but we don't really push very hard. So if you want to roll out two hard forks, then you have this boilerplate time that will eat up both of, from both of them. So that's the extra. I, I just wanted to chime in on Don Crowd's point from the Coinbase perspective. That's what I represent. And I know that we're still here kind of building trust, you know, convincing it. <laughs> like, I get it. I get it. Like, it's the first time you've had me in this room. Um, but, you know, we've been, wor we've been working with Proto for the last five months on EIP 4844, implementing it in Prism and Spec, uh, Prism and Geth. Um, and I think... To Don Crad's point, the difference between like H1 of next year and 2024 for a business like Coinbase is massive. And I think the way that shows up is we have products that we've built on chain, smart contracts that we want to be launching. Like literally we want to be launching in Q4 and Q1 of next year and we can't right now. And that is because at the scale that we're operating at, where we're talking about bringing millions or tens of millions of customers into those contracts in our wallet products fully non-custodially, it's just too, too expensive. Most of our customers who are not in the US can't pay for it. And we as a business, especially in the bear market, can't subsidize the costs for them. And so what that means is that in the context of these conversations, the people who maybe don't understand the technology benefits of decentralization or security, they then go and say, hey, there's all these other EVM chains 
they have sub one cent fees. Can we just deploy this thing on that? Like, would that be a faster? Can get can that get this thing shipped in Q1? And it's up to the people like me, maybe, or others in the company who, who understand the whole process and why we're doing roll-ups and why this is such an important investment from a decentralization security perspective to say, no, like we need to wait. We need to wait for this to have the right solution. And so I think waiting until the beginning of next year, you know, first half of next year, I feel like that's like a, a thing we can hold. We can make it happen. Waiting until 2024 is really hard. That's going to be a real challenge for us. And so I think, I think from, from where I sit, um, our feeling is like, let's make the list of all of the things that all of the people in this room feel like we need in order to feel comfortable. And if that's better monitoring of the network so we can understand bandwidth, if that's better testing so we can feel more confident in the change that we're making, uh, whatever it is, like give us the list, give optimism the list, and we're ready to throw resources at this and support this. And I know that, again, we have a lot of trust to build. That will come through in its work. A year from now, I hope that there's a lot more trust here, but I do want to voice like that's the impact for, for a business like us. And we're ready to come to the table with you all and work together to figure out how do we make it so the end result is tens of millions or hundreds of millions of more users are using Ethereum by the middle of the end of next year. So <laughs> I, I have, I have uh, two rebuttals to uh, to, to putting uh, Void for Four in, into Shanghai. Um, one of them is uh, I don't I don't I don't see any rollups that are trustless right now. Uh, most of them don't implement the the fraud proofs. Uh, they're putting the data on chain, but the data is not really used for anything. So uh, like you cannot use it to to prove that the that the that the rollup is wrong, and so. If we implement uh, thanks sharding, we basically say to the community, use these rollups, but the rollups are not secure. Um, I think that's kind of a, it's a minor problem. It's, it's uh, the other thing, the bigger problem I, I see is that uh, from yesterday's conversation just doesn't seem ready yet. So withdrawals, the way I see it, are basically done. They like they are implemented in some of the clients already. Um, the spec seems to be pretty stable, and uh, with uh, Deng Sharding, we recently had a new fee market change that I don't know how much thought has has been put into it. Uh, from from my point of view, it. it it, like it, the the fee market change at some some fifteen fifty nine like uh, thing, and from my point of view, it it looks like we have a hammer, the 1559 hammer, and now every everything looks like a nail, and um, so I think there has to be more. Well, it's just changed the unit of it. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. okay, and you know. Like this change was like in the pipeline for like months, I think. It wasn't like something we suddenly came up with. It was clear we wanted to do this. And we do have the change implemented in Geth and Prism in a live devnet. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but those are things that, <laughs> those, those are things that are, uh, they were not, not quite clear to me. And um, so from my point of view, we could ship with uh, withdrawals easily January. Uh, Especially if we if we uh, like kick out some of. The time <laughs> <laughs> Peter says it takes three months. This is, this is three months. <laughs> so yes. Be ready now. now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. <laughs> okay, but it's it's probably a bigger change for the for the consensus layer. I think for the execution layer, it's it's pretty uh, pretty much done, and. Um, Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Maybe I'm I'm totally wrong here, um, but I I agree with the argument that so even if we were to ship uh, withdrawals in January, um, I think we could only ship uh, Deng sharding in September <coughs> of uh, of uh, 2023. If we were to do both. We can probably ship it somewhere in the middle, 
and uh, so actually would if i if i really have if i really think about it it would probably cut to two months uh to to, to both of it even even though i don't like it and even though i don't like to admit it um but i think it might be the right thing to do i mean Lying i think like oh. the, the what you what the Sorry. feeling you have is probably that it is a bit more risky to do both at the same time and i think like most people would probably agree with that like that making a bigger change definitely adds to the risk of the hard fork itself um, and I think we also should have an honest conversation on in which cases we are willing to accept those risks because what we're doing is just so important that maybe like some risks have to be accepted as part of doing it. So Paul's uh, been waiting well. Yeah Paul from Teku team just on that I mean there's a couple of aspects maybe we need to get better at doing hard forks and releasing them honestly it's a long time between code completion and getting to getting to that gate. That may be a thing we need to address. But the other side of it, playing devil's advocate, I understand that 4844 might be important and if it's relatively well defined, there's nothing physically stopping us from doing that first. And just delivering 4844 and not delivering withdrawals. I mean, it's a, it, is, it is an actual option that we have. No, I'm playing devil's advocate, Paul, sure. Paul is not representing the views of the techie team. <laughs> This is, no, but it's a fair comment. It's a fair this comment. is purely my view, but in reality, if two is too hard and we want to deliver this early in a timely manner to not stuff over businesses, that is an option that we do have. Yeah, we should absolutely yeah. focus on doing the most important thing first, always. Uh -huh. um, I think a point that's come up a couple of times is you know, when we ship withdrawals, and it's actually when we finish code completion. Because running through test nets doesn't take quarter of time. We put out a release that it should be pretty quick and easy. Um, there is coordination cost, and it consumes all core devs for a while. So you've got to know what's coming next if you're going to paralyze it. But it's code completion that's the big thing. I'll give it to Dan. Uh, in between, I'll just uh, pop in. Um, so in my opinion, withdrawals are kind of spec'd out. So it, I mean, there are variations, but it's simple. It's really, really simple, whereas with the um, 4844 that will most definitely take a lot more time to spec out and it has a lot more potential problems with denial of service and everything. It, effect, it affects network. So withdrawals, that's just a tiny consensus change. You know, tweak a bit the data structures and done. With, uh, with 4844 that has a much deeper implication. So I think it, it will require a lot more work. And in my opinion, it would be much simpler to say that, okay, for, uh, withdrawals are definitely going in, and maybe give a cutoff that if we, for some reason, 4844 gets complicated and we cannot finish it by month X, then just say, okay, we're rolling with the withdrawals first, and then whatever, whenever the other is ready. So, quick question from me, because I've heard the term a few times, like about code completion, and then rolling the, the change, and uh, that we are very slow in the second part, but you know, I, I joined late. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm a new guy. But what I observed with the merge, we uh, we shipped uh, shipped in middle of September. But what I observed, like from my the definition I know, the code was not completed in, in August, and some teams were like pushing the changes at the very end. And for me, like when you say that code is completed, you know you. You've been testing, you start testing, and you don't introduce new changes, yeah? So the code is stable. So it looked a little bit differently from my perspective. Yeah, yeah I agree. The merge was not a case where we were code complete three months before. Um, so, yeah, but, but, but we have done that before, right? Like, and, and, you know, again, I think Burden London was like a good example. As soon as we were kind of code complete on Burden, we started working on London before like it shipped. And part of the reason for that three month delay is not like for the client teams, it's for like everyone running your node, like folks like Coinbase, because usually like people like, and not to point out Coinbase here, like people just don't care about the hard forks until they're like announced on a blog post on blog.ethereum.org. Um, and then they're like, holy shit. And then they like message me and they're like, oh my God, we need to like upgrade all our infrastructure. And you know, and especially so if like it's a complicated hard fork, if it's just like introducing a new opcode, um, they need to upgrade their nodes. And still sometimes, you know, they're like, oh, we need like two months to do that or something. So it's, it's worth noting, like we can, set our schedule somewhat independently of like the release schedule. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean you want to like 
do cold complete and ship two weeks later because it, there's still value in giving people time to upgrade. And I, I would also argue the merge was like cutting it close. And um, I think, you know, the merge was like a big change, the environment bit, the like proof of statement. So I think there was a bunch of variables in that one. Um, but if you look historically, we've been like kind of slow, but I think that's, that's like healthy for people. Like pe people who like are not core developers should not have to look at this stuff every day to know like, is there a hard fork in 10 days, right? Uh, Dano, Baso Maintainer. Um, one of the ideas that you, you sent to me once, uh, Tim, that might help, because I'm hearing a lot of just talk about um, lots, lots of bandwidth, lots needed in, in the layer one. Um, what if we prototype some of our ideas relating to things like EVM and transaction formats on a layer two, and that way the libraries and the tooling could adopt to that on the layer two stuff, and then um, all the downstream stuff is ready, and then layer one can implement it when they have the bandwidth um, and not having to rush in and get those in. So you can get cool things like BLS transaction formats sooner rather than in 2024 or 2025. I really do like the idea. At the same time, we as layer two optimism especially, we're trying not to stray away from layer one where we create conflicts in development. We are literally just trying to, if we could, we would run GAF without modifications. We don't want to be different. And often I just like client teams, layer one developers, to be more receptive towards changes, but also testing and like creating confidence in these changes. As layer two, otherwise you get this conflict of interest where okay, you want to make the change to be special and new and exciting and cheap, but you, you're you not shipping the Ethereum dream. Yes. Like, and especially data availability, like for it for four, we, we, we can't even ship it on layer two, or we, like, we create a layer three situation with a much, much smaller validator set. When we go through that big list of uh, proposed EIP stuff that's coming up in the next thing, like half of them are just EVM stuff. And that stuff is easy to push through. But then you get into the situation like we had with subroutines, where it was implemented, it was ready, and then the week before the first test net, all of a sudden it gets ripped out. I mean, I, I like the idea, but you're voicing the exact concern. How do we get the commitment that if it's done, it will ship on layer one without substantial change? Because then if you have these changes on layer two and they change substantially, then it's a burden on the layer two chain if they put it on, on one of their premier chains rather than on a test net. So one thing to answer here is that I think it's very, from the outside, it, it's a bit strange because it kind of looks like there is commitment to go with an EIP. And in reality, what at least what I've experienced is that most layer one, most execution clients won't even touch an EIP until somebody else actually implements it and verifies that it's correct. So usually you have the EIP authors, which kind of have to beg one of the clients to please implement it. And, and everybody is just waiting for that client to implement and find all the corner cases and when when the core devs say that, okay, we are releasing this EIP in three months and everybody goes into this holy shit mode and okay, let's <laughs> quickly implement it. And then we kind of like pursue this dream of rollups as like, like competitive execution layers on top of a secure data layer that's minimal and like widely decentralized. But right now, we don't have a layer two EVM standard. But I mean, what if you wind up in a situation like Coven where you had part of the chain that ran with Wasm and then all of a sudden Wasm's gone, and then all of a sudden the one client that can run Wasm's gone, um, and you can't run the chain from zero. Is that a bad thing? Is it an okay thing? I would say it's pretty, pretty bad. So it's, it's, it's basically just shoving tech up to layer twos, and then the cost is incurred by users, being confused why their smart contract works on one chain, not the other chain. Right. Just, yeah, we, we can wrap up here, but like, yeah, we, in, in, yeah, we can, I mean, if there's final comments, we can do that, then maybe we should take a short break, but just wanna make sure we wanted to keep the last hour to discuss actual EIPs, because um, we, we don't usually have like forums to do that with all the client teams. So um, if people wanna have less comments or take a short break, we can do that, yeah. but let's, let's take a break for like five minutes and then let's have uh, the Shanghai AIP outers line up or switch the spots with the yeah. current yeah, core devs. Yeah, come to the front if you're That EIP would be champion. awesome. Thank yeah. you.
Let's go. Yeah, go to the bathroom or something. <laughs>